go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Madison and um, I'm going to be introducing Katerina and Refuge Volunteer and Programs Coordinator and is super involved with Red Wolf Conservation at Coast and Lakes uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And so I'll go ahead and turn it over to her to uh, share with you uh, some information about the Red Wolf. Uh, thank you so much, Madison. So yes, my name is Katerina Ramos and I am the Refuge Volunteer and Programs Coordinator um, out of the Coast and Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about the very endangered red wolf. Um, and before I start going, there we go, sorry. Before I start going into all the fun details about red wolves, I really wanna talk about the Endangered Species Act, um, which is the very act that helps us create recovery programs for at-risk species that are either threatened or endangered. Um, so the Endangered Species Act was first introduced in 1966. Uh, it was an Endangered Species Preservation Act, and it was really just for uh, game animals and wild birds. Um, and this is where the bald eagle was actually put on the endangered species list, as well as the whooping crane. And as we all know now, the bald eagle has made a great recovery from the low population numbers that we saw way back in the 60s uh, due to the Endangered Species Act and that protection and recovery program that it developed. Um, so in 1966, we had the very beginnings of the Endangered Species Act. In 1969, it was amended to include animals outside of game and wild bird species. So this started including animals like reptiles and amphibians to kind of help with their conservation. And then in 1973, we came across the Endangered Species Act as we know it today. Um, with the purpose of it is to protect and recover imperiled species and the ecosystems upon which they depend. Um, and it is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Commerce Department's National Marine Fisheries Services. So basically this encompasses all of the endangered species that we know today and their recovery programs. And this is also where we have the red wolf. Um, and the way that the Endangered Species Act defines uh, endangered or threatened species um, is that they define endangered as either extirpated or extinct from their native lands or at risk of being extinct from their native lands. And threatened would be that they're at risk of endangerment uh, due to low population numbers. So it really depends on what, how low those population numbers are for those species and how at risk they are for extinction. Um, and of course, as uh, many people have said in previous seminars, the red wolf really hit a very low population number to where they were com like almost completely uh, extinct in the wild. So when we think about the red wolf, what is it? Um, and of course, we all have the image in our head of when we see all these other seminars and all this other information of our very picture perfect red wolf, which of course is on my screen there having that really gorgeous red rusty color to him and, and that bright uh, yellow or, or dark amber gaze. Um, but these guys are pretty small. They're uh, on the smaller side of wolves. They have a weight range of 42 to 84 pounds. Um, to put it into perspective, when you think about the gray wolf, they can be upwards of 100. <laughs> uh, so they're a pretty small wolf. Um, they have that really pretty coloration of reddish brown uh, and brown mixed with tan and, and black and and uh, all of that gorgeous color. They have different colorations uh, when and and uh, morphology or sorry, not morphology, uh, phenotypes, meaning that they have uh, different versions of their colors. So some may seem a bit more of a uh, tan color. Some might have a stronger coloration with that black and red and really stark contrast, um, but they're all within the same kind of uh, coloration. And their eye color can be anywhere between yellow and green and brown. Um, so obviously in this picture we have more of that yellow amber gaze um, instead of anything like brown or, or green. Um, but one thing I really want to know is the most distinguishing traits about a red wolf and these distinguishing traits really come in handy uh, as we start talking about different ways that we are uh, recovering the species. And it's that, that they have really long legs. Um, and a lot of the times the Red Wolf team <laughs> likes to say that these guys are on stilts just because they have such long legs compared to the rest of the species that you'll see on the landscape. 
Um, they also have these rounded ear tips. So you'll see in other species, they're a lot more pointed um, on our landscape. And this is kind of a dead giveaway whenever we see canids that this is the red wolf because of its really rounded ear tips. Um, another thing is how large their feet are. They have really large feet compared to other canids on the landscape. Um, and it's really helpful when we're discovering tracks and trying to figure out whether it's uh, a red wolf, a coyote, or a fox, or anything like that, when we can see it's a, clearly a very large footprint. Um, so those are some of the more distinguishing traits uh, to kind of help us when we're doing identification, especially when we're out in the field and doing uh, work on the landscape. Um, when we're thinking about what a red wolf is in terms of their behavior and their lifespan, um, when they're forming packs, they're really more of a family group. Um, so we have the whole conception of alphas and, and betas and, and the movie perfect of pack dynamics. And really for the red wolves, it's just a male and a female with their babies. Um, so it's just the breeding male and female of the pack and then around a couple of offspring from the last year or two that are sticking around. Generally, these packs are anywhere between five to eight wolves. Um, and their litter size can be anywhere between three to five puppies. So uh, after they've had like a year or two within their pack, they'll ordinarily disperse and move away from their family pack and develop their own pack. Um, and it's really, really unlikely that they'll accept non-family members within their pack, um, which is not really as known uh, with other species of wolves where you have a couple of different types of individuals that'll join a pack sometimes. Um, when it comes to red wolves, they don't really do that. They like to keep to just their family pack and, and their offspring. Um, in terms of how long the red wolf lives, uh, in the wild, we've seen wolves live up to around seven years old. But in captivity, we've had up to 15-year-olds in captivity, um, which is really just marvelous because seeing some of these older wolves has been really interesting. Uh, they still kick around and, and have so much fun. And, uh, really awesome to see. Um, so I mentioned packs and, and dispersing and things like that, and their territory can be uh, pretty interesting. It really depends on the quality of the habitat that they're in. Um, for some packs, their range can be anywhere from 15 square miles all the way up to 60 square miles. It really depends on how good that habitat is, how much prey there is on their habitat, so how much food can they get, um, how much can they really move around, is there a lot of wolves around them that are holding territory, that kind of factors into it. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that they like to communicate their territory. And many people think when they hear the word wolf, uh, they like to think of just howling in terms of communication. And there's a lot more to red wolf communication than just howling. And as you can see on my lovely little image here, we have a male wolf marking his territory on Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so part of their communication is actually leaving scents in locations to mark their territory. So and when we think of our dog and every time they go to a specific location to uh, scent or mark, it's really them marking that this is their territory, um, especially when it's the same location every time. It's just uh, really showing like, hey, this is this is my land. Um, so that's a, a way that wolves will communicate sometimes to other wolves or even other animals that, hey, I live here. Um, another way is body language. So uh, if you have dogs, you definitely know that dogs will communicate with their body language. Many people like uh, love to see the happy tail wag that dogs do, but wolves have that same kind of communication. They'll change their body shape to mimic whether they feel threatened or they're upset. So they'll go ahead and raise that hair on the back of their, um, along their spine. They'll go and bare their teeth if they're upset. Um, and sometimes they'll go and lick their teeth to kind of show submission. So really there's a lot more to that communication than what we normally uh, perceive as wolf. Um, but of course, they also have their vocalizations. And um, what is not commonly known is that sometimes red wolves can actually yip and howl. Uh, so it's not the same as you hear when you hear coyote yip, but there are shorter bursts of almost barking, uh, if you would like to say, with mixed in with their howls. 
and I want to go ahead and and show you an example of this through the uh, Wolf Conservation Center in Salem, New York. They have many videos on red wolf howling and you can kind of hear that difference. So as you can hear, uh, he there was quite a, diff a couple of different types of vocalization, both coming from red wolves at that location. Um, so they have different types of vocalization, not just the regular long drawn out howl. Um, what's really unfortunate is that we're not entirely sure why wolves howl in the first place. Uh, there's a couple of different speculations that maybe they're communicating um, where they are in their location. Uh, there's some speculation that maybe they're talking about where food is or territory or trying to speak upon um, any dangers. And then there's other speculation that maybe they just enjoy doing it for fun. Um, there's, you know, we really won't ever be able to know what they're howling about unless we somehow learn how to speak wolf. <laughs> um, but it's really cool because they have these really intricate type of vocalizations and they, it, it sounds eerie, but it also sounds funny at the same time. You heard that one that did a whole bunch of weird huffing howl type bark uh, sounds and it's just really interesting to hear them um, and hearing them on the landscape is even cooler just uh, very eerie but also very relaxing at the same time um, so aside from their behavior and what they look like what do they eat um, and what's something that I always love to point out about wolves is that they're not really going after the most healthy individuals in the population um, they actually go after more of the elderly and sick animals. And this actually helps the health of a lot of the prey populations that they come across. So being able to catch these older individuals or sick animals helps keep the herd or the population of the prey a lot more healthy than if they were these elderly or sick animals were allowed to exist. Um, and they very rarely take livestock. And I, I want to point out, and this was something that I believe Ron Sutherland had pointed out when he did his presentation, but in the history of the Red Wolf program, which is around 30 years old, there's only been six reported cases of livestock deprivation. So it's really not a common occurrence. Um, they have more than enough prey on the landscape in order to keep them full and uh, keep them on the landscape and, and away from livestock. So really, even at the height of our program, where we had quite a few number of wolves, uh, livestock depri deprivation wasn't really a big issue. Um, so other than talking about how they prefer older and sick animals, uh, what really do they eat? And one thing I really want to point out, because it's such a great thing, is that they eat nutria. Um, and why it's so important that they eat nutria is that nutria is actually considered an invasive species to North Carolina. They actually really destroy habitat and they can destroy a lot of vegetation if they are allowed to run rampant in the, uh, in the population. Um, so red wolves being able to predate upon nutria really helps with those population numbers and helps decline that population. Um, so them predating upon nutria is really good for the environment and actually really helps the health of the habitat as well. They also like small mammal type prey, so squirrels and, and rabbits, those are more of a uh, common type species that they'll end up catching um, and predating upon. And then they also hunt white-tailed deer and they actually eat raccoons. Um, and this actually makes up a pretty large part of their diet when you look at their predation numbers. They do like to eat white-tailed deer. However, like I said previously, they'll mostly take down elderly or sick animals. Um, so and when it comes to the white-tailed deer population, uh, Ron, Ron Sutherland did do a study on the uh, population and, and diversity of species on the landscape and found that red wolves don't really have a negative impact 
on the diversity of species um, on the refuges. So they really don't have a significant impact on the white-tailed deer population, but they do have a really nice impact on the raccoon population. Uh, so much so that uh, they have around two to five pounds of food per day and about 50% of their diet consists of white-tailed deer. Um, and then 30% actually uh, consists of raccoons, which is really great because it takes down that middle type predator within the environment. And uh, raccoons, if they have high enough populations, can really hurt that prey population that a lot of different species rely on. And then another 20% of a red, red wolf's diet depends on the small mammals, so like the squirrels and the rabbits and things like that. Um, and any food that the red wolf does catch, so say they end up uh, catching a white-tailed deer, they'll actually cache food. So they'll, they'll almost preserve their food and save it for later by burying it and then return to it uh, when they need to get food again. So they kind of have that interesting squirrel behavior where you'll see a squirrel dig up a whole bunch of dirt, throw an acorn in it, and then cover it back up again. So they have that same type of behavior that allows them to kind of preserve their food and um, and take up as, as much as, as they possibly can from each uh, predate, uh, predation event that they uh, occur. Um, and so talking about what they eat and how they're affecting the environment, I figured it would be good to kind of give a uh, basic idea of how a red wolf really helps the ecology of the environment. Um, so it kind of helps how the interactions between animals and vegetation and things like that help the environment. So this is a very, very watered down version of a red wolf kind of food tree. Um, obviously there's, there's multiple indications of red wolves predating in this, um, tree, but I kind of just made it as simple as possible just because when you start going into food webs, it can get a little, little hazy. But so you have your red wolf as that top predator in the environment, and then you have that middle predator, which is the raccoon. And then you have that prey species, which in this case, I just made a squirrel. And then you have your, uh, your plant species, which I just did a tree for this instance. So the red wolf will go ahead and eat the raccoon, the raccoon will eat the squirrel, and the squirrel will eat part of the vegetation. So that's kind of how that food web works in a very basic, basic version of it. Um, but what happens when there are no wolves on the landscape and we have um, this food web kind of get disturbed? So when we think about an environment with no wolves, uh, we have this middle predator, which in this case is going to be the raccoon, and we have a prey species, which in this case, I made a turkey for fun. Um, so we have this turkey species, and as we can see in this little environment that I created, there's only one turkey, but there are five raccoons. So there's a whole bunch of raccoons and only one turkey. So there's really not a healthy population here because Right now, the prey species is way smaller than the number of predators that we have. So this middle predator is continuously going, continuously eating our prey species, and there's really no check and balance because there's nothing higher up attacking uh, or taking away those raccoons or middle predator. But when we have an environment with wolves, we have two wolves here. So say we have a pair of wolves here, and there's only one raccoon in this picture but we have a whole bunch of prey species. And this goes back to talking about what the red wolf diet consists of. So 50% deer, 30% raccoon, 20% small prey or mammal species. And this is kind of what we mean. So you have two wolves that have multiple prey sources that they'll use, but raccoon or this middle predator may only be able to take out this specific prey species. So as soon as you limit this population with that middle predator, you start seeing a really large population increase with that prey species. So this, incre this increases the health of the environment. And this is kind of what we mean about the effects that wolves have on the environment and why they're so important to have on the landscape. So since they're so important and they're great for the landscape and they're really unique and, and neat to look at, how did they become endangered in the first place? Um, so a lot of it was human based. So we had predator hunting, excessive hunting of game species, so limiting their prey supply, uh, habitat fragmentation. So as people started moving into these more rural areas and developing them, they started seeing less 
uh, habitat available to them or larger stretches of habitat missing so they're not as connected. Um, and also a negative public perception. Um, though apex predators have a bit of fear behind them, they're actually really important for the environment. Um, and with hunting them down and trying to get rid of them and extirpating them from these developed areas, it really created this negative perception that uh, apex predators are no good. Um, and so this happened in the early 60s. Uh, they finally got listed as an endangered species when they were only limited to a certain part of Texas or only found in a certain part of Texas. So they've been on the endangered species list since 1967. Um, so they've been endangered for a really long time. Um, and another way that they were, uh, they became endangered was their population numbers became so small that as soon as the coyotes started moving in, they started hybridizing with the coyotes. Um, when their populations became so small, the, the interaction between wolves was a lot less likely as it was with the interaction with coyotes. So um, I like to call it a last ditch effort <laughs> to procreate when they uh, hybridize with coyotes. And it has been shown that when a red wolf is given the opportunity to be with another red wolf, they'll stay within their species. But last ditch effort is kind of being with a coyote just to be able to pass on that uh, new pool kind of. So that really hurts the population because then you're decreasing that diversity within the red wolf population and creating uh, a problem with each individual species. So how are we recovering the species? So as I said, the species was on the endangered species list since 1967. So what have we done, as we know, to help recover the species? Because part of the Endangered Species Act is to help it recover. So we did reintroduction. So in 19... 1987, there uh, was an effort to establish a non-essential wild population at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. So this is the only known wild population of red wolves in the world. The rest of the red wolves are actually within captivity. And we have around 200 or so red wolves in captivity, uh, part of a breeding program in order to increase their genetic diversity. Um, and this non-essential wild population came about after the red wolves were declared extinct in the wild. Um, so with this reintroduction uh, program, the population numbers reached a high of about 130 known red wolves in the early 2010s. Um, and currently with that non-essential wild population, we dropped to around 14 known red wolves in the wild. Uh, so that's a, a pretty big change from the individuals we first reintroduced in 1987 all the way to that really nice high in the 2010s and then to current day where we have that 14 um, back in the wild. Sorry about that. I thought I turned off all of my phones. Um, so why are they important? Um, so as I said, they actually have help with that uh, health of the environment, and they're really unique, but there's a whole bunch of different reasons. So when I talk about the health of the environment, it's really talking about how red wolves are a keystone species. So with red wolves, we get this nice balance to the environment where there's uh, kind of a check and balance to being able to keep uh, this continuous version of the environment without super limiting the prey species or super limiting our predator species. Um, they also help the ecology of the landscape in general. So having that kind of balance really helps and also helps the health of the environment um, and health of the populations as well. So, you know, taking down the elderly and sick individuals really helps the health of even the populations of prey species. Um, and they also limit coyote populations. And I know that sounds really conflicting because they do hybridize with coyotes, but they also found that when you have pairs of red wolves on the landscape, they can limit the territory that coyotes can establish. And the way that coyotes establish territory is they may have a couple individuals in a certain area. That can really hurt population numbers for prey. But when you have red wolves, you just have a pack of red wolves in a 15 to 60 square mile radius. Um, so that really limits the amount of predators on the landscape and of course adds to that uh, health of the environment. So limiting that coyote population kind of helps limit what the coyotes can predate upon and even uh, growth of population numbers, which is also helpful to humans. 
Um, another thing that they're important for is ecotourism. So the red wolf is actually the only species of wolf you will ever find in the United States that only exists within the United States. Um, so the gray wolf is found in the Canada, uh, United States area. The Mexican gray wolf is found in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico area, and Mexico. But the red wolf is only ever found in the United States, even historically. Um, so as you can see on my little map here, we have what the recover what the red wolf historic range was. And then in this little tiny area, North Carolina is where our recovery area is. So not only are they great ecotourism for the United States in general, but they're really great ecotourism for North Carolina because you will never be able to see a wild red wolf anywhere else besides in the recovery area in North Carolina. Um, in addition, our red wolf program is the only is the first program that used pup fostering to help with reintroduction efforts. Uh, and basically what pup fostering is, is taking captive red wolf puppies and bringing them to a den mother and integrating them within her pup, her litter and increasing that genetic diversity, as well as increasing the likelihood that those pups survive into adulthood and become breeders of them of, of their own. So it's a really great location. It has his history to it. And of course, it has that rarity to it that if you see a red wolf in the wild, you know you're not going to see it anywhere else. Um, so with all of that information, the, the rarity of seeing the species and how important they are and the recovery program, how are they currently being helped? So I speak a lot about what happened in the past and, and what they could be adding to the environment if their populations continue to grow, but what are we currently doing to kind of increase that likelihood of the population thriving? And um, currently we have an entire collaborative group that works on education. So North Carolina Wildlife Federation, Defenders of Wildlife, Wild Insect Network, and Red Wolf Coalition really work together and uh, work towards spreading information about the red wolf and educating on, on the reality of red wolves as well. So um, some people have never even heard of the red wolf, and it's such a great species. It's truly an American species, um, but it's so important to learn about. And in, in order to help the program move forward and help the population move forward, it's really important that we increase the awareness and understanding of the species. Uh, that way we can continue to foster this great environment of moving forward with the species and recovering it. Um, and one of the ways we do that is we have the Red Wolf Center. So the Red Wolf Center is located out of Columbia, North Carolina. It does have two exhibit wolves um, in that center, and one of them is right down here. His name is Manny. He's really cute. Um, and that kind of helps bring that realistic look of, oh, hey, I can go see a red wolf in the recovery area um, and learn about red wolves, how they howl, how they eat, what they eat, things like that. Um, and also see some of our taxidermy and some of our specimen and, and talk to people about the red wolf that is in the red wolf program. Um, so it's a really great location. It's uh, a nice little stopping point for when the visitor centers are open. Uh, currently it is closed due to uh, COVID-19, but it's a really great location for the future for ecotourism and education for the red wolf. Um, and for people to kind of make a nice little stopping point to learn about the red wolf. Uh, another way that they're being helped is actually the killers. So a big, uh, a big problem with the red wolf is uh, gunshot mortality. So a lot of the uh, population loss that we have seen is due to gunshot mortality or vehicle mortality. Um, and one way that we're trying to help with gunshot mortality is wearing orange collars on the wolves. So orange collars are really bright, as you can see in this picture by running wild media, you have that wolf running, but the first thing you notice is that bright orange collar around its neck. And this is mostly because a lot of people want to get rid of coyotes on their land. Um, but red wolf and coyotes have a little bit of similarity to them that make them hard to distinguish. So the recovery program is putting orange collars on to kind of help discern the difference between coyote and red wolves. That way we can kind of reduce that gunshot mortality happening. Another way we're helping is pray for the pack. So I mentioned that one of the reasons why the red wolf uh, 
became an endangered species was because of habitat fragmentation and habitat loss. And Pray for the Pack is a collaborative program with North Carolina Wildlife Federation and Partners for Fish and Wildlife to uh, invite private landowners to become a part of a cost share program to help uh, increase habitat availability and uh, increase habitat health on their lands. So it's a program where we work with private landowners uh, on improving their land in what both benefits them and our own mission um, and is a cost share program. So we have a 50% option and we have a 65% option. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the Pray for the Pack program, you are more than welcome to contact me about it. Uh, we look for private lands that are located within the five county recovery area. So that would be Dare County, Beaufort County, Washington, Terrell, and there's one more. And I just completely blanked on it. Um, but the five county recovery area, that's really embarrassing. Um, so if you have any questions about it, please let me know. Um, and I will gladly answer any questions. Um, and if you want to be a part of it, we would love to have you a part of it. It's it's really just a collaborative effort and and working with the community to, to kind of help the environment. Um, and then outside of our nonprofit organizations helping, we also are seeing a, uh, a lot of help with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So in 2020, they were able to release a female and a male translocated uh, red wolf from the St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge. So they added two new individuals into the environment. And then recently in 2021, they uh, released two male red wolves from the St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge onto Alligator River. And then in May or April, uh, they successfully fostered four red wolf puppies into a denning female red wolf so that's part of our pup fostering program and she accepted those four red wolf puppies um, as well as us getting two females and two male captive red wolves on acclimation pens on Bacosan lakes and alligator river national wildlife refuge so really we're starting to see a really great forward momentum with the program and increasing those population numbers and that that genetic diversity on the landscape so there's a lot of uh, hopeful idea or or perception for the Red Wolf program. And we're, we're hoping it'll just keep on moving forward, uh, especially as we start doing more education and, and speaking more about the Red Wolf. Um, and so with all of that and, and, and what is currently being done to help the Red Wolf, how can you as an American citizen or a North Carolina citizen um, help the program? And uh, there's many different ways that you can actually help. So you can donate uh, if you want to donate to NCWF or uh, any of the collaborating organizations helping in the recovery effort. Uh, it'll help us with our education and um, our movement to help the red wolf recover within their historic range or even just within the wild population. Um, you can also call your representatives and voice your support for the Endangered Species Act or voice your support for Recovering America's Wildlife Act or both of them. Um, but definitely calling your representatives and saying how you are in support of these two acts would really help the program as well. Um, you can also share information about Red Wolf. So I mentioned before that there's many people that don't even know that the Red Wolf exists. And um, so if you're sharing information about Red Wolves and, and following the recovery page or even following any of the organizations and, and spreading it to people you know or anything, it, it helps in our mission of education. and and creating awareness of the red wolf and the recovery efforts of the red wolf. Um, so you can get all this information by joining newsletters from the different organizations. You can join NCWF's newsletter. Uh, you can follow the red wolf recovery page on Facebook. Uh, you just type in red wolf recovery and it'll pop up. Um, or you can go on to any of the nonprofit organizations and just keep up to date. Uh, many of the organizations, uh, especially NCWF, uh, keeps a uh, newsletter and also uh, updates our um, press releases on different aspects of what we do, especially the Red Wolves. Um, another way you can help is by joining wildlife advocacy groups that are connected with the program. So you can volunteer with the NCWF or any of the collaborators. You can become a member of any of these organizations or you can join an affiliate chapter. 
uh, of the organization. So I'm going to do a very shameless plug of the NCWF chapter program that we have. Uh, we have chapters just about all over the state um, and are currently trying to develop a chapter in Columbia, North Carolina which is where the Red Wolf Center is located. Uh, so if you're interested in helping create a Columbia chapter or you live near Columbia or interested in that, um, definitely contact me because we would love to create a chapter specifically in that Red Wolf recovery area um, where there is no chapter currently. So um, if you're interested in the chapter for Columbia, definitely contact me. I would love to have more people come and join and, and show interest in it. Um, and with that, if you have any questions, I will gladly take them now. Um, there is my contact information right there for y'all. Uh, I generally answer my emails pretty fast. Um, so I would love to have just conversations with you in general. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome, Kat. That was fantastic. I learned so much about Red Wolves that I didn't already know. And we do have quite a few questions in the chat, so I'll just go ahead and relay those over to you. Um, Chris is asking what caused the large drop in the 11 years from uh, 210 to 14? That's a great question. Um, in that time period, the Fish and Wildlife Service was unable to do the normal recovery efforts of translocation of individuals, um, introducing pups or doing pup fostering, and we ended up experiencing a large amount of vehicle mortality and gunshot mortality within the species. Awesome, thanks for elaborating. Uh, DL Roy is asking, how common is it to see a red wolf in the recovery area by tourists and by researchers? So, <laughs> um, when I was originally an intern for the red wolf program in 2018, I was able to see a breeding female on the refuge around uh, close to like nighttime, uh, like later afternoon. Um, I have yet to be able to see a red wolf in the wild since then. Um, however, I do catch them on my cameras. They do take surface roads. It all depends on the time of, of the day that you get on the refuge. Um, and also, of course, uh, how much they're moving during the day. So I've known people to be able to catch pictures of them, but I've also known people you know, morning, every evening and couldn't find a red wolf for anything. So it, it all depends on if you're in the right place at the right time, especially with their population numbers so low, it's a little hard to catch them as often. Awesome. And you can, of course, always see the captive ones, correct, when the refuge is open, right, right, Kat? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can see our captive wolves when we have our visitor centers open um, and we're doing programming. So ordinarily we'll do programming near or in front of our exhibit pen and that's where you can see this lovely little lady right here. Um, she's one of our captive wolves in in the uh, exhibit pen and, and she's a she's a hoot to watch. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Um, Casey is asking is coyote sterilization a part of the recovery effort? Currently it is not part of the recovery effort. Um, as far as it is known. Awesome. Uh, John is asking, have any red wolves been seen outside of that five county area? Uh, so currently the individuals that we can track are all within the recovery area. However, um, as time goes on, you never, you're not able to collar every individual that you come across on the landscape. So as far as I know, there hasn't been any sightings past the five county recovery area. Um, however, there's there's always the possibility just because of dispersal and sometimes wolves like to move a lot. <laughs> awesome. Let's see. Um, Emily is asking, what do you think are some of the main research needs for the red wolf? Well, currently Wildlands is doing a research project on uh, quail populations in response to red wolf populations. So they're doing a study looking at how quail populations uh, are when there's a red when there's red wolf present and, and when they're not. Um, however, I think uh, because they're so close to the wolf and, and everything, um, it's a little hard to without thinking about specific needs for 
the red wolf, it, it's hard to be able to pinpoint exactly what is need, needed to know more about the red wolf itself. Um, and so I really can't give you a solid answer for that. Um, I think the biggest thing is looking at how they change or help uh, the ecology or the environment um, within our recovery area. Just, just being able to take advantage of like, hey, how is this looking as our populations are growing? Um, that would be my biggest, my biggest question that I would love to answer through research. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's see, we have a few more questions here. Amanda is asking, how often are gunshot mortalities traced back to someone? Uh, as far as my knowledge, it's really hard to trace gunshot mortalities back, especially when uh, sometimes we'll get a mortality reading on a collar and the environment tends to decompose the body pretty fast. Um, so it's, it's really hard to kind of discern where the gunshot mortality comes from or who, who did it. And um, there's also, there was also the problem was uh, people mostly thought the red wolves were coyotes. So it's, it's not very, very common. Awesome. We have lots of thank yous in the chat too for, for such a great presentation. <laughs> so shout out there. Uh, Suzanne is asking, any idea when the visitor center will open again? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, and unfortunately, due to COVID-19, I really don't have a solid answer. Um, there is some rumors of when we'll reopen, but at the moment there's nothing definitive and no specific date that I can give you other than um, if you are on our NCWF newsletters, you'll definitely be hearing about whenever I get to start doing programs for the Red Wolf program and opening visitor centers. <laughs> um, but definitely keep an eye on our refuge system and, uh, you know, be be part of any of the Facebook pages and and we'll definitely be advertising when the visitor centers are open again. Awesome. Yeah, I, I want to visit it, too. So uh, hopefully they open again soon. Um, DL Roy is asking, have the researchers been able to define any diseases in the wolf population? Um, no, the only disease that was a problem with the red wolf population was when they first started the reintroduction effort in um, in uh, the, the 1980s. And they tried having a non-essential wild population in the Smoky Mountains. And to my knowledge, that ended up becoming unsuccessful due to parvo. Um, but as far as my knowledge of the population currently, I do not think there is any disease that is really causing a problem for our populations. Awesome, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Um, we don't have any more questions currently, um, but you are welcome. Oh, we do have, it looks like Suzanne maybe has her hand up. Suzanne, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, or if um, that was maybe the same one in the chat, just let me know. Hi, no, that was just the same question. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Uh, oh, it looks Thanks. like Bob maybe has a question. So Bob, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, you may do that. I was just curious if you were working at all with the facility that's located uh, down in Awanda, South Carolina. I know uh, some of the wolves at Alligator came from there, and I didn't know if you were still working with that group or not. That's U.S. Fish and Wildlife down there. To my knowledge, um, I haven't learned anything of it, but at the same time, we do work with quite a few facilities, so it's it's very much so possible. Um, and to be honest, if there's any facility that has a red wolf, uh, has, has a known red wolf individual, they are part of our species protection program. Um, so we end up having a log of where each individual red wolf is being housed if they're in captivity. Uh, so we are in contact with any organization or facility. That yeah, has this is a red wolf uh, center that's run and managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife down. It's uh, north of Charleston. So I thought perhaps you were aware of that. I also know that Brook Green Gardens is building a 
red wolf habitat, and they're supposed to get some individuals there. Yeah, it's it's uh, certainly possible. I'm not sure of all the, the connections with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, but if they are part of the Fish and Wildlife Service and they're developing uh, an education location for it, I'm sure I'm sure we are completely <laughs> involved with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Great questions. Um, Emily is asking, would you mind putting the names of those two facilities, Bob, in the chat? So, so Bob, if you want to put those in the chat box, um, that'd be great. Alrighty, I don't think that there are any more questions, but thank you so much to everyone who tuned in today to uh, hear about the Red Wolves and I hope you learned something and feel inspired to um, help protect wildlife and habitat even more. Uh, but thank you, Kat, so much for taking the time out of your day to teach us a little bit more about red wolves as well. And I uh, hope everyone has a great Endangered Species Week. Our next webinar is on the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, and that will be on Friday. So we hope to see you then. But have a great, have thank a great so week. Much. <laughs>